Welcome to this video on ATP. So ATP is an RNA nucleotide derivative. That means it is essentially an RNA nucleotide, but it's been modified in some way. So here is the structure of ATP, and you should be familiar with some of this if you're familiar with the structure of RNA nucleotides. So we have the ribose sugar, we have an attached uh, adenine base, and then over here we have three attached phosphate groups. So if you think about the name ATP, which means adenosine triphosphate, then this kind of makes sense. The adenosine part is the ribose with attached adenine, that's known as adenosine, and then triphosphate, three phosphate groups. Now we can also uh, talk about uh, adenosine diphosphate and adenosine monophosphate. Hopefully you can work out what they mean. Adenosine diphosphate is the adenosine part here with just two phosphate groups, and adenosine monophosphate is the adenosine with just a single phosphate attached. So what is the function of ATP? Well, it is an energy carrying molecule that is essentially the energy currency within a cell. That is, the energy within ATP is used to power many reactions and many processes within the cell. So for example, ATP is needed for protein synthesis, it is needed for active transport, it is needed for muscle contraction, but it's also needed for thousands of other functions within each cell. So you should probably be familiar with glucose being an energy containing molecule in that we often eat food in order to gain the energy within that food. And in most cases, that energy is found within glucose. And when we respire the glucose, we release the energy. Well, actually, that energy that's released from glucose is not used immediately by the cell. Instead, it is contained within molecules of ATP. So for every molecule of glucose we respire, we can synthesize 38 molecules of ATP. Well, why is it then that we use ATP instead of glucose? Well, the first reason is that it stores less energy than glucose, 1 38th of the amount of energy in glucose, in fact. Now, the reason that that's useful is that most of the processes, most of the reactions that occur within a cell don't actually need that much energy. And the amount of energy stored within ATP is just about right. Whereas the energy stored in glucose would be far too much. So the fact that it stores less energy than glucose is useful and more efficient. Secondly, it uh, very quickly releases the energy. So it's a one step reaction to release the energy. We'll have a look at that reaction in, in a moment. But if we compare a one-step reaction to release energy in ATP, that's opposed to um, uh, respiration, which takes hundreds of steps in order to release the energy. Thirdly, ATP is resynthesized quickly. It's a one-step reaction to resynthesize ATP. If you compare that to glucose, well, the process of synthesi synthesizing glucose in plants, which is photosynthesis, again, it takes hundreds of steps in order to synthesize that glucose. So it's a very long and arduous process. Synthesizing ATP, very quick, very easy. Finally, ATP cannot leave a cell. Glucose can diffuse in and out of a cell. ATP is restricted to being used within the cell that is synthesized in. That means that each cell is responsible for making all of the ATP it needs itself, but it knows that any ATP it makes is going to stay within the cell. Right, let's have a look at this reaction then for breaking down ATP and releasing the energy. So it is a hydrolysis reaction. Here we have ATP and water. Now remember, hydrolysis means hydro, water, lysis, break. So we are using water to break the molecule of ATP into a molecule of ADP, and a phosphate group. So we're essentially releasing one of these phosphate groups off the end. How does that release energy? Well, this phosphate group often remains attached to another molecule. So for example, if it's an active transport pump, the phosphate group remains attached to that uh, protein. And in doing so, it makes the protein either more reactive or it causes it to change shape. Now, in the case of an active transport pump, when the phosphate group remains attached to the active transporter, it causes it to change shape and causes it to move whatever molecule it's moving across the surface membrane. So we have a simple one-step reaction for releasing the energy. And equally, if we reverse this reaction, so we have a condensation reaction, so we... Um, 
attach the phosphate group to the ADP molecule that causes ATP to form and also water, a condensation reaction. So a simple one step reaction to resynthesize it. Now the process of breaking down ATP to release energy occurs all over a cell all the time, but the process of resynthesizing ATP, well that can only occur during respiration or during photosynthesis. The process of breaking down the ATP requires an enzyme. The enzyme is known as ATP hydrolase, so effectively hydrolysis of ATP. ATP hydrolase can be found all over a cell and is often forming part uh, of other molecules within the cell. So for example, an active transport pump will have ATP hydrolase activity. On the other hand, to resynthesize ATP, we've got the inventive, uh, inventively named ATP synthase enzyme is required. So ATP synthase will cause ADP to react with PI and that will produce ATP plus H2O. So it's ATP hydrolase to break down ATP and ATP synthase to resynthesize it. So we can summarize all of that in this diagram here. Here we have ATP, we have a hydrolysis reaction using ATP hydrolase to break down ADP into AD, uh, ATP into ADP and PI, the PI often attaching to another molecule to make it reactive or change shape. And then we can resynthesize our ATP during uh, respiration or photosynthesis. That's going to be a condensation reaction. It's going to require ATP synthase and it is going to release water. Here are the key terms from this topic. Write these down now if you wish. Lots more resources on my website, pxsbiology.com. And if you found this video useful, then please remember to like, subscribe and share.